audio lecture of Unit 6 for Contemporary West, Industrialization and Nationalism from 1800 to 1870. We're going to start by talking about industrialization, or sometimes called industrialism, if you're going to use the ism term, and the impact that it will have on society. The Industrial Revolution begins in Great Britain before it does anywhere else in Europe. And this, there are a couple of reasons for this. First of all, it has plentiful natural resources. It has a large population that can um, be workers. Uh, it has a lot of wealth and a lot of markets with which to trade. Great Britain becomes the starting place of the Industrial Revolution as a result of this. So we're going to start by discussing the factors in Great Britain as to why it became the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. Agricultural practices became more efficient through the last half of the 1700s, the 18th century, um, and they produced more food at lower prices. This will lead to, of course, more people. Remember, we've talked before, more food, more people. And that will lead, of course, also to more workers that can be used in the industrial society. Another thing that changed was the enclosure movement. As part of this agricultural revolution, along with new agricultural practices that led to more food production, we had more land being brought under production for um, farming with the enclosure movement in the 18th century. Now the enclosure movement basically put fences around the old common lands that had been part of the feudal system back way back in the Middle Ages. These common lands that the, all the peasants were allowed to use um, at any given time were now being fenced in by the landlords, by the gentry in England, and they were now being utilized uh, planted um, for cash crops to use commercialized agriculture. And this caused many peasants off of the lands, ultimately, by not being able to have a subsistence living off of these common lands. They are now forced to find work elsewhere. Many of them will move into towns. Many of them will become cottage industry um, workers, as we'll discuss in a later slide. And this, of course, also caused an increase in the labor supply, more people to work in um, different kinds of industries that will help to give birth to the Industrial Revolution first in Great Britain as well. Also in Great Britain, there was a wealthy merchant class already in place, and they had a ready supply of capital to invest in the new industrial machines which are being developed and the factories that are also being developed. Now this means that eventually they're going to move away from the cottage industry where people were working in their homes um, to produce thread for textiles and then weave them into cloth using hand labor um, in these cottage industries to people moving into towns again and working in these massive factories with these massive machines that are being invented to uh, do these um, um, to do this labor. Uh, the entrepreneurs um, in this group, these merchants, um, devise new business methods and ways to make profits. And ultimately, some of that included investing in new ideas to produce new machines to help them make products more quickly and efficiently and get them to market quicker. Britain also had plenty of natural resources that were needed for the Industrial Revolution to happen there first. No, such natural resources like water. Water can be used for many different things, but when it comes to the Industrial Revolution, it can be used to help power some of the machines that are now being invented. Coal could also be used to power these machines, as well as iron ore being utilized to build the machines. So these are all other reasons why Great Britain was first in the Industrial Revolution. Britain also had a vast colonial empire 
that gave the British manufacturers a ready outlet for goods. Now, the colonial empire worked two ways. Oftentimes, the British merchants could get raw supplies, raw materials that they could then make into manufactured products at home, raw materials that they couldn't grow at home. For example, cotton. Cotton does not grow well in England. Um, and once cotton uh, cloth becomes the um, more desired kind of textile, they need to get um, that from other places. It's too cold and wet in Great Britain to grow cotton. So they gain cotton from their colonial empire, places like um, India and places like uh, Northern Africa. And before they lost control of North America <laughs> from the Southern um, colonies in North America. So uh, they could get raw materials to manufacture into goods, but then they could also sell those manufactured goods back to those colonists living in the colonial empire of Great Britain. So it would work two ways. It was a win-win for Great Britain. They could get raw materials and they could have new markets for their goods to gain more wealth. In the 18th century, as I was discussing before, cotton production using the cottage industry system was made inefficient by a series of new technological advances. This is when we start seeing the shift away from the cottage industry where workers are, you know, spinning cloth on a spinning, uh, sorry, spinning thread on a spinning wheel or weaving thread into cloth on a hand loom. Instead, uh, inventions are being um, made that will, you know, make a large spinning machine like the spinning jenny, which could spin a lot more thread at one time rather than just what one person could do with a spinning wheel or a powered loom, which could, of course, weave the thread into cloth more efficiently and quickly as well. So we will see these kinds of inventions are being being um, built in Great Britain, largely because Great Britain had always been a massive supporter of the scientific revolution. Those royal societies um, of scientists were now taking science out of the laboratory and applying it to business. And ultimately, this is going to uh, give way to the Industrial Revolution in Great Britain first. You can see on this map here, industry in Great Britain by 1850 was massive. Lots of all those little dots are um, manufacturing towns that had popped up all over England. So England was about a century ahead of the rest of Europe when it came to industrialization. Now, I mentioned some of those new machines, okay, those new technological advances, such as the spinning jenny uh, and the flying shuttle gave Britain an advantage in producing inexpensive cotton goods. Um, some of these machines will be explained a little bit more in your packet as well as in your textbook as well. Ultimately, these uh, uh, cotton goods became, of course, the, all the rage. Replacing wool fabric or wool textiles, with cotton textiles being the most desired textile in the world. So the cotton industry in Great Britain became more productive and it became even more productive than that when a Scottish engineer named James Watt modified a steam engine, an earlier rudimentary steam engine that had been built to drive machinery. Now the steam power could be applied to these machines and make them more efficient and move more quickly, producing more product um, at a faster rate. The steam engine was crucial to Britain's Industrial Revolution leading to an expansion of both the coal and iron industries. Now, when it came to um, powering the steam machine, you need coal. Of course, you need to burn the coal to produce the steam and the steam being released to power the machine. But also you need something to build the machines out of and that's where the iron industry came into play. Puddling was a process used to make high quality iron for the production of new machines, especially things like locomotive trains, which could be used not just to transport goods, but also to transport people from place to place.
Factory owners wanted to use their machinery constantly. So laborers worked in shifts instead of just, you know, one um, time period during the day. There would be shift work instead. And machines would run continuously. This is why you needed good, strong iron, because if the machines are working continuously, if the iron is not high quality that the machine is built out of, it will break more easily. We also will see that child labor was very common during this time. This is before they had a lot of child labor laws, and ultimately, um, children could be hired by these factory owners because they could be paid less, and oftentimes their small little fingers could be used to help unjam machines, um, even though it sometimes cost, you know, injuries to these children, sometimes life-threatening and life-ending injuries. We will do more with child labor um, in an exercise that we're going to be doing uh, for the class later. Railroads, as I mentioned before, moved and manufactured goods more efficiently as well. The first commercial railroad connected the cotton manufacturing town of Manchester in England to the port of Liverpool. Manchester became a big um, textile producing um, city, but they were landlocked. They did not live, they, they were not located on, um, on the coastline, and Liverpool was. Liverpool was a port, um, and so ultimately these two would be connected through this railroad um, construction. Railroads will become key, a key component of the Industrial Revolution throughout Europe, not just in England, and also in the United States, by the way. Um, and they will lead to an ongoing economic growth because of the Industrial Revolution, because of them being able to get goods to market more quickly um, and efficiently. Also, of course, steam power could be applied to other kinds of transportation as well, like boats as well. Now, we will see eventually industrialization spread to the continent. The pace of industrialization in Europe and the United States depended on many factors, including government policies. In other words, many of the other nations in Europe and in, in the United States may have had some of the same, um, I guess you would say, factors, key factors that Great Britain had to, as to why industrialization was able to happen there um, easily, but they may not have had all of the ones that Great Britain had. And so therefore, um, they would not develop industrialization as quickly as Britain would. Um, governments in Belgium and France and also in some of those Germanic states uh, supported industrialization and provided funds to build roads, canals, and railroads, all with which to get products to market more quickly. When the Industrial Revolution spread to the United States, thousands of miles of roads and canals were built to link the East and the West and helped to expand uh, our nation out westward as well. After, of course, we had purchased the Louisiana Territory from France when Napoleon was in power, we will want to expand into that region and railroad construction will help with that as well. In 1807, speaking of transportation, Robert Fulton built the first paddle wheel steamboat, improving transportation on the waterways. Eventually, railroads provided the most effective means of transportation in the United States, but the steamboat will also be um, a United States invention that will eventually transform transportation within the United States along rivers but also it will eventually be utilized between um, the United States and Europe um, on the high seas. Um, in the United States, as farmers and immigrants filled the cities in the United States, a labor force became available for factory owners to expand their industries in the United States as well. Women and children, um, who were paid lower wages often worked in factories as well. This is the same pattern that we saw happen in Great Britain and in other parts of Europe happening in the United States.
Now let's talk a little bit about the social impact of the Industrial Revolution in Europe. Industrialization urbanized Europe and created new social classes, as well as the conditions for the rise of socialism. Now we haven't talked about socialism per se yet, but we will talk about it as a reaction to the Industrial Revolution. Um, it's a both a political as well as an economic um, ism, things that end in ISM, okay, that we'll be discussing um, a great deal in the second half of this course. European cities and towns grew dramatically by 1850, all throughout Europe, um, as well as in the United States, due to industrialization. Factories were built in towns and cities to take advantage of those increasing populations that had a, a labor force. The rapid growth of cities led to overcrowding oftentimes in those cities, which of course led to disease being spread readily as well as poverty. So a downside to industrialization is the rise of um, slums um, and problems uh, with um, social groups that develop as a result of overcrowding as well, including crime as well as disease. Industrial capitalism rose, however, during the Industrial Revolution and produced a new middle class, the ones that built the factories and owned the factories. They are the ones that bought the machinery and developed the markets for the goods. These entrepreneurs were oftentimes associated with the traditional bourgeoisie that we have been talking about in the earlier centuries, but these were specifically um, ones that became increasingly more wealthy due to industrial capitalism because of the mechanization of industry. So a growing middle class, upper middle class factory owners now. The Industrial Revolution also led to the development of an industrial working class, okay, the ones that the factory owners need to hire to work in their factories. The working class had little protection from factory and mine owners and often faced dangerous working conditions. And this is one of the reasons why um, socialism will uh, develop in the middle of the 19th century as a response to the desire for workers to gain more, um, to get some results from their, from their working um, factory owners, sorry, and uh, they will eventually start to push for more changes and this will eventually lead to the creation of working unions, if you will, or labor unions. Women and children made up a significant portion of the labor force due to the low wages. Um, the factory owners could justify paying them less than anybody else. Um, they weren't men, they were women, they were children, and they could justify paying them even less. Um, and since there was no government regulation of wages, there was no such thing as a national minimum wage in these nations as the Industrial Revolution bloomed. Um, the factory owners, they had a huge labor supply, and if you didn't like the pay that you were given, the factory owner would just say, okay, you're dismissed, there are 14 other people that are unemployed, that are willing to work for any wage um, rather than be unemployed. So uh, since the government was not regulating a minimum wage, um, oftentimes the wages did not increase very rapidly. And this of course will cause a desire for social reform um, and unions and eventually the rise of socialism. So it was uh, reformers, uh, that wanted to make changes to these harsh working conditions, people working 16 hour days with a 15 minute break, um, working in terrible conditions, putting them, their lives at risk oftentimes, et cetera, et cetera. It advocated this new ism, which will be known as socialism. <clears throat> and they believed that public ownership of the means of production, meaning the factories and the machines, would allow wealth to be more evenly distributed. So the people who were advocates of socialism were ones that were advocates of <clears throat> communal ownership 
of the factories rather than the capitalists owning the factories, the business owners owning the factories. <clears throat> Utopian socialists were the first group of socialists. They're nicknamed Utopian because later socialists like Marx, who is known as the, I guess you would say the, the you know, granddaddy of the socialists, even though he's later, um, he will nickname these earlier socialists Utopian socialists because he believed that their ideas were too idealistic and were not based in scientific reasoning. Anyhow, one of the earliest of the Utopian socialists was Robert Owen. He was a Scotsman who believed that an ideal society could be created through socialism. He was very idealistic. He kind of based a lot of his ideas off of the ideas that we saw in um, Thomas More's Utopia book. It was written back in the 1500s. And he believed that if the factory owners allowed for their workers to ultimately participate in the process of ownership um, and share in that idea, forming, forming co-ops and those kinds of things, that ultimately it would benefit everyone, including the factory owner himself. <clears throat> that it would ultimately incentivize people to work harder and produce more if they felt that they had more of a stake in that production and if they felt safe in the workplace and felt cared for in the workplace. Again, later socialists like Marx, even though, again, he's considered the granddaddy of the socialists, believed these ideas were too idealistic. And then there was never a way to make the factory owners understand that the people <clears throat> should share in the ownership of that property, of those businesses. Ultimately, Marx would be an advocate of a kind of revolutionary socialism, um, which will eventually be known as communism, which we'll cover in a moment. Now, let's talk a little bit more about reaction and revolution after the Napoleonic Age as well. Again, we will talk more about socialism and about Marx and those kinds of things later on uh, in another unit. Let's first talk about the political ideas that are going on after the defeat of Napoleon in Europe. So after Napoleon's defeat, the victors, the, the winners, met in Vienna um, and they referred to this meeting, this summit meeting as the Congress of Vienna. Congress just means meeting, okay? The Congress of Vienna. They meet in Vienna, Austria to try to redraw the map of Europe, to create a balance of power once again, and to strengthen what will be known as classical conservatism, which is like a return to traditional monarchy, even a return to absolute monarchy in many places, uh, etc. <clears throat> so after the defeat of Napoleon, Great Britain, Austria, Prussia, and Russia, met at the Congress of Vienna to restore peace and to balance the power in Europe. They have to redraw the boundaries that had been erased by Napoleon's takeover of all those territories. And they have to reestablish the balance of power that had been lost due to the fact that France uh, had taken over everything. Now, the person who was the host of the Congress of Vienna was the chief minister of Austria. He's kind of like the um, prime minister, if you will, um, underneath the um, emperor himself. His name was Clemens von Metternich. And he was sort of the host of these negotiations. These are basically the peace settlement treaty. A peace treaty will be um, negotiated here to end the Napoleonic Wars. And he wanted conservatism, or what will be re referred to as classical conservatism. He wanted to restore the monarchies that had ruled all over Europe prior to Napoleon, removing them from their thrones and putting his own family members in those positions of power. He also wanted a uh, guarantee that the nations of Europe would combat any and all upheaval that might upset the balance of power in the future. They saw these folks at the Congress of Vienna after the age of Napoleon saw nationalism and even 
revolutionary ideals like classical liberalism, the ideas of natural rights of man, and all those things that had inspired the French Revolution, they were now seen by many as dangerous, as opening up a Pandora's box and um, causing havoc throughout Europe. So these European powers that I mentioned before, Great Britain, Austria, Prussia, Russia, as well as France, France was actually invited to the negotiation as well, even though they had removed Napoleon from power, they had put King Louis XVIII in power and he wanted conservatism too. Okay, these European powers divided the land to ensure political and military stability throughout Europe, ensuring that balance of power. They also agreed that they would meet regularly in conferences uh, to make sure that that balance was maintained. This will be a group known as the Concert of Europe. And if you think about it, the Concert of Europe was kind of like the first um, international organization that was designed to, quote, keep the peace in Europe, end quote. In reality, it was designed to put down any and all liberal and national rebellions and to maintain the balance of power through strengthening classical conservatism, strengthening monarchies, and strengthening the status quo, the, the way things had been prior to the age of revolutions. The European powers believed in a political philosophy known as conservatism or classical conservatism. The reason I keep saying classical conservatism is it is different than modern day conservatism, okay? So 18th century or 19th century classical conservatism was the belief in you know, having absolute monarchy, um, having privileged classes like the nobility, having certain privileges that couldn't be touched, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so this is, in other words, this kind of classical conservatism is based in tradition. The value of social stability, uh, meaning the nobles at the top and the majority of the folks being crushed by those nobles, and an organized religion. Of course, the power of the clergy, whether it be a Catholic clergy or, you know, even in Protestant nations, the religion being controlled by a conservative monarch. Um, <clears throat> anyhow, the European powers, except for Britain, okay, uh, adopted through the Congress of Vienna and through what would be the Concert of Europe that I mentioned in the previous slide, what was known as the Principle of Intervention. The Principle of Intervention allowed the great powers to send armies into nations where revolutions would take place throughout the 1800s, whether those revolutions were based on you know, uh, enlightenment ideas, which will now be known as classical liberalism, meaning things like equality and um, equality before the law and natural rights of man, etc. Or if they were based on nationalism, meaning we want to form our own government and overthrow the current government to form our own government. Again, this principle of intervention um, would take place through this concert of Europe, this international organization where these nations pledged that they would support, you know, um, fighting against these kinds of rebellions um, with their military forces. Great Britain did not agree to this, and this is largely because Great Britain was a fairly classically liberal country already with a constitutional monarchy and with certain um, rights already being guaranteed to the people through equality before the law and those kinds of things with their own constitution. So they were not so keen in participating in this concert of Europe to squash those kinds of rebellions. However, they were would participate in squashing rebellions that would overthrow governments completely. They were for constitutionalism, but maybe not for overthrowing monarchies completely. So constitutional monarchies were one thing the Republican kinds of revolutions where they wanted to get rid of the monarchs, that was not um, in the right minds um, for the British, as we know, since we revolted against them to form our own republic, we meaning the United States. <clears throat> Great powers will use military forces to put an end to revolutions all throughout Europe 
um, as we go through the uh, 1830s and into the 1840s, okay? Um, these are places like Spain and Italy, uh, and we will see monarchies being restored in all of these places. Now, there were some forces of change where we see classical liberals and nationalists opposing the existing political system, threatening conservative regimes. Those were where those rebellions took place, even though many of them were squashed. While conservative governments were in charge, powerful forces still existed, such as liberalism, and they would continue to be spread. This was a byproduct of the French Revolution and even of the age of Napoleon, as we discussed before, how the ideas of Napoleon spreading nationalism ultimately will impact Europe for generations to come, long after Napoleon is gone. <clears throat> Liberals, and at this point, classical liberalism is what we're talking about. Again, different than modern day liberalism. Classical liberalism is more like enlightenment idealism, but updated for the new century, for the 19th century. Okay, so they wanted things like civil liberties, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, equality before the law, religious toleration, and a government ruled by a constitution much like the government in the United States and for our Constitution, and even like the government in uh, England under the constitutional monarchy. Many liberals wanted a, an ex, you know, explicit written document like what we had in America with our Constitution that outlined a particular Bill of Rights. Y'all know the first 10 amendments to the Constitution are our Bill of Rights, where <clears throat> we advocate things like those things listed in the previous um, paragraph, liber civil liberties, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, etc. Another force of change in the 19th century, in 19th century Europe was of course nationalism, which we've been talking about since the Napoleonic era. Nationalism arose when people began to identify themselves sometimes based on some kind of common thing that they shared. As I mentioned in a previous unit, sometimes it was based on that we all speak a common language or we all have a common religion or we live in a common region or we have some kind of common cultural traditions and customs. Nationalism ultimately would be seen as a threat to classical conservatism because giving independence to nationalistic groups could upset the balance of power that had been established at the Congress of Vienna. So the traditional classical conservatives did not like nationalism. Nationalism seemed to go hand in hand more with classical liberalism, of course, than it did with conservatism. Conservatism was anti-nationalism because they saw nationalism as upsetting the status quo. Beginning in 1830, liberalism, meaning classical liberalism, the 19th century definition of it, which is basically, like I said before, enlightenment idealism updated for the new century. So beginning in 1830, classical liberalism and nationalism went hand in hand and led to some revolutions taking place in Europe, okay? I already mentioned Spain and Italy, but we also see some other places. Of course, France, France always rebels, <clears throat> and Belgium, both of them actually overthrew the current conservative regimes. France will eventually end up with a more constitutional style monarchy instead of getting rid of monarchy altogether. Um, uh, Poland and Italy were unsuccessful in their rebellions, however. Now, that was in 1830 with those rebellions, but what we will see happen here is in 1848, by the time we get to 1848, beginning of course in France, because when Paris sneezes, Europe gets a cold, we sometimes refer to these revolutions in 1848 as a revolutionary virus, starting in France and then spreading throughout Europe. These are revolutions fighting for things like 
classical liberalism and nationalism. Okay, um, and one of the major things that happens in France was after the rebellion against Louis the 18th in 1830, uh, they had tried to establish a more um, fair constitutional monarchy, which ultimately fell apart, and there was a, a more conservative king that was next in line for the throne. They had a rebellion against him and once again established a traditional constitutional monarchy with a fairly classically liberal king under Louis Philippe. Economic troubles in France, though, led to a new rebellion in 1846 and then eventually in 1846. Okay, what had happened is under the constitutional monarchy of Louis Philippe, the monarchy was um, not seen as doing enough to alleviate the financial situation. Does this sound kind of familiar to you? This is similar to how things started with the regular French Revolution in 1789. Ultimately, the constitutional monarchy in 1848 will be overthrown and a new government will be established. Um, under the policy of universal male suffrage. Now, what that means is all men get the vote. The word suffrage just means the right to vote. Universal male suffrage. And they are attempting to establish yet another French Republic. This would be the second French Republic. Unfortunately, the second French Republic lasts less than a year. And by the end of 1848, once again, the um, uh, Second French Republic will uh, be in jeopardy due to a Bonaparte taking over and establishing himself as emperor. Okay, so in 1848, initially after overthrowing the constitutional monarchy, a new constitution will be ratified, creating the Second French Republic as the new government in France. Eventually, it would be that uh, republic which will allow for a Bonaparte to come in and eventually overthrow it because they elected a man as their president of this republic named Charles Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. He's the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte that we've discussed already. Okay, and largely he gets elected because of his name. Remember, the people of France love Napoleon. He's very popular. And so he will uh, be elected as the president of the Second French Republic. Eventually, by the end of 1848, he is able to use the same kind of policies that Napoleon, his uncle, had used to um, gain con complete control over the government using the plebiscite, using that national referendum vote to gain himself a position as the um, second emperor Napoleon, um, even though he will take the number Napoleon III, Emperor Napoleon III, okay, out of respect to the son of Napoleon who had never been emperor. So we see that happen once again in France. Now in Germany or in the German um, Confederation, um, the 38 independent states of the German Confederacy attempted to unify in 1848 as well. This is another 1848 revolution. They were inspired by what they had seen happen initially in France with the overthrowing of the um, monarchy and the establishment of the Second French Republic. This is prior to uh, Napoleon, uh, Louis Napoleon becoming Emperor Napoleon III. Um, and so they attempted to unify. Now, German nationalism was a real thing that was inspired largely by the remnants of, you know, the Napoleonic age. Um, however, a lot of these different little German states could not agree on what kind of government to establish. They came together in a meeting at, called the Frankfurt Assembly and met in Frankfurt. Um, and they began um, to try to work through what kind of government they would create. Ultimately, the Frankfurt Assembly would fail to gain the support of one of the biggest leaders in all of those German states. Frederick William VI of Prussia will refuse to acknowledge the creation of a unified German nation. He did not want to lose absolute power in his own Prussian nation for Prussia to join with these other 
37 states in the German Confederacy to become the German nation because the Frankfurt Assembly was fueled by liberalism, classical liberalism, and the desire to create a republic rather than having a, you know, a kind of um, um, authoritarian monarchy, which is what he had, the absolute monarchy. So ultimately, the revolution of 1848 will fail in Germany, it will fail to create a unified Germany, and Germany will not actually unify as a nation until 1870. And this will happen um, under a completely different movement that was actually fueled by classical conservatism, believe it or not. We'll talk about that at a later time. Austria, however, will also have revolution in 1848. In Austria, remember, we've talked about this before about Austria. The empire of Austria was what we call a polyglot state, a polyglot empire, a multinational state that included people from many different ethnic backgrounds, German background, Czech, Hungarian, Poles, Slovaks, Slovenes, Romanians, Croats, Italians, Serbians, and Ukrainians. What ends up happening if you have a polyglot empire and nationalism settles in any of these uh, different ethnic groups? If they decide we want our own state, we don't want to be part of a, an Austria anymore, we want to create our own Czech state or our own Hungarian state, for example. Well, the whole thing could unravel. And this is one of the reasons why at the Congress of Vienna, Metternich was so um, adamant about ensuring classical conservatism throughout Europe because he was scared. He and the emperor of Austria were scared of nationalism. If nationalism took hold in Austria, the entire empire could unravel. And that's exactly what almost happened in 1848. It started by the Hungarian and Czech folks demanding their own independent governments, um, independent of the Austrian Empire. Eventually, they would be crushed by the Austrian forces that got a little help from Russia, that one of their allies at the time. And this will eventually lead to these rebellions coming to an end in both Vienna and So ultimately, the revolutions of 1848 as a whole failed. They failed to usher in, you know, uh, a new era with classical liberalism and nationalism having um, a major force. We see in France, yes, they get rid of a constitutional monarch and they create a republic, but ultimately that republic gives way to a president who eventually uh, names himself emperor and we have a Bonaparte on the throne again. Um, in Germany, we attempt unification through um, classical liberalism, and we fail because the staunchly conservative Prussian king, or Kaiser, refuses to acknowledge it. And in Austria, we see these revolutions fail with a strong um, emperor uh, being able to crush the movement and come in and reassert his own power. So in general, the revolutions of 1848 failed, liberalism and nationalism ultimately fail to um, produce real results in the revolutions of 1848, okay? Revolts in northern Italian states in Lombardy and Venetia were also put down by Austrian authorities. They were also another version of, you know, the revolutions of 1848 failing um, uh, for, in Austria because the Austrians who had control over Northern Italy will remain in control over Northern Italy, Lombardy and Venetia. And we will not see these areas getting freed from Austrian control until the 1860s when we have the um, Italian unification movement, which will be discussed later. All right, so now let's talk a little bit more about nationalism with the unification movements that I've kind of alluded to. The, the ideas of classical liberalism and nationalism uh, that failed to produce real results in the 1848 revolutions, we will see have some, nationalism anyways, will have some success in unification movements in the German states and in Italy as we move into the later half 
of the um, 1800s, of the 19th century. But they will have to take a different approach than those earlier revolutions that failed took. And that's what we'll discuss in this next section. All right, so let's first of all talk about <clears throat> the rise of nationalism leading to these unification movements, okay? Now, there were some areas where we will see um, it not really work, um, nationalism not really work to create a true strong unified nation. Um, Russia tried to add some territories uh, to, their, um, to their nation uh, since they are always seeking warm water ports, they try to invade the Balkan provinces of Moldavia and Wallachia during the southern part. They had belonged to the Ottoman Empire and they wanted those territories. This is part of what is known as the Crimean War between 1853 and 1856. The Ottoman Empire, as I said, controlled these provinces and they declared war on Russia when Russia started acting aggressively to try to take these territories. By the way, this is the same territory that Russia is acting very aggressively to try to take once again, right now, current day. Great Britain and France, however, did come to the aid of the Ottoman Empire to keep Russia from being able to take those territories. So because of the foreign intervention, Russia will not be successful in taking these territories. Why did Great Britain and France do this? Great Britain and France were both fearful of a stronger Russia. They were fearful of a stronger Russia, and not that they really cared about the Ottoman Empire, but because they wanted to thwart a stronger Russia, um, which um, worked to their advantage at that time. Oddly enough, within a generation, they will ally with Russia against Germany and Austria in the First World War. But at this point in time, they are um, allying um, with the Ottoman Empire to fight against the Russian aggression. <clears throat> in this war. It, it was because of the British and French intervention in the Crimean War on the side of Turkey or the Ottoman Empire that um, Russia will lose this war. Uh, heavy casualties caused Russia to pull out of the war and the Treaty of Paris, yes, yet another Treaty of Paris, this is like the third one, okay, uh, that takes place in 1856, will end the Crimean War and will place the provinces that were being contested, okay, those areas of the Crimean territory, instead of under Russian control or under Ottoman control, they will actually be placed under international control. This will come into play, this Balkan region will come into play as a major flashpoint um, as we lead up to World War I. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind because when we get to World War I and we talk about where the war begins, it begins in this area, the Balkans region, okay? And there's a lot of long animosity left over from these kinds of, uh, you know, nationalistic movements in the middle of the 19th century that come into play leading up to World War I. Now, the effect of the Crimean War was that the concert of Europe, however, was ultimately dismantled. Uh, Austria did not support its long-term ally in the war, which had been um, Russia, and Russia and Austria ultimately become enemies. This is important leading into the early 20th century, because as we approach World War I, Russia and Austria will be on opposite sides. Had Austria supported Russia, in the Crimean War, that might not have happened, okay? So we will see implications leading up to World War I happening during this time period. Without Russia, Austria could no longer really prevent Germany and Italy from forming their own states. And so we have the unification movements happening finally in both Italy and Germany as we move into the later half of the 1800 of the 19th century. <clears throat> it begins in Italy, really, right after the failed 1848 revolutions to try to get Austria out of northern Italy. 
Shortly after, in 1850, people started looking to the northern kingdom in Italy. They had a small kingdom, the kingdom of Piedmont, to lead the unification movement in Italy. And so what ultimately happens is Piedmont, which was a small Italian kingdom based on classical liberalism with a constitutional monarchy, that will become the nucleus around which all of Italy will unify to create the kingdom of Italy. Okay, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes a decade or so. <clears throat> but ultimately, because the nucleus around which Italy unifies is a classically liberal state, a constitutional monarchy, ultimately the uh, kingdom of Italy will be a classically liberal kingdom, a constitutional monarchy. It will mimic the nucleus around which they unify. However, there will be some methods that will be used by Piedmont and the leaders in Piedmont to achieve unification, which are based on different principles than those earlier failed revolutions of 1848. Okay, yes, nationalism will still be a major um, influencer in this movement, of course, Italian nationalism, but they will also rely on some Machiavellian principles which will be known as the um, politics of reality, or what we like to call realpolitik. We'll talk more about this in the next few slides. We'll see similar movements like this in the German unification movement as well. Okay, so now we're gonna discuss these unification movements in Italy and Germany specifically. Um, but before we get to each individual one, I do want to point out to you all that there are some similarities and differences um, in these unification movements. And so just like we do in this class all the time, one of our historical thinking skills that we do is comparison. And in comparison, you need to look at both things that are similar and things that are different. This would be a great kind of essay question as we often see on a unit test. So it's something that you may wanna pay particular attention to and then be able to plug in specific information from either state um, in order to back up your point if you were to have an essay like this. So first let's discuss the similarities. When it comes to the unification movements, meaning creating a unified German state and then creating a separate unified Italian state, meaning finally having a kingdom of Italy and a kingdom or empire of Germany. We see the similarities are that they both combine the concepts of nationalism, which we've been discussing, okay, and realpolitik, which I just mentioned in the previous slide, okay? Now we know what nationalism is, okay? Something that makes a group of people feel that they should have their own nation based on some common trait that they share. That could be a common ethnicity, it could be a common language, it could be a common language, it could be a common region that they occupy, or it can be common cultural practices, okay? And we know that nationalism was kind of fostered and encouraged and, um, and, and blossomed as a result of the age of Napoleon and the, of course, you know, French Revolution. Now, what about realpolitik, as we call it? Realpolitik really means the reality of politics. And in reality, it's something that we've been discussing since the beginning of the year when we talked about Machiavelli, okay? What it is is the use of pragmatism and practicality. Now, pragma pragmatism is doing whatever needs to be done to get the end result that you want which sometimes means that you have to do things that might be unpalatable to you or may be unpalatable to others, okay? Sometimes you need to use, as it says, whatever means necessary to achieve that goal. And the goal here with the realpolitik movements in um, the mid-1800s is the unification movements, unifica unifying Italy as one nation and then separately, Germany unifying as one nation, okay? So as we usually discuss with Machiavellian ideas, realpolitik in this era uses things like raw power, war, and even deceit to get the end objective. 
this sh should sound familiar to you. Um, as I said there, someone from Renaissance Italy have a similar idea? Of course, it's Machiavelli, okay? It's just Machiavellian ideas updated for the mid-19th century, okay? So the similarities are that both use nationalism in Italy. It's Italian nationalism. It uses Eastern nationalism. And both of them use realpolitik, meaning that their methods use pragmatism and sometimes using whatever means necessary to achieve the goal of unification. Now let's talk about the differences. The governments that each of these new nations um, use when they form, once they unify, are completely different, okay? As I mentioned previously, Italy, once it becomes a unified nation of Italy, the kingdom of Italy, it will create a classically liberal constitutional monarchy. And that is because the nucleus around which they unified was the city-state of Piedmont, which was a constitutional monarchy. So just like in a molecule, the, um, you know, the, uh, the entire molecule kind of mimics the nucleus. So if the nucleus was a constitutional monarchy, ultimately, once Italian unification happens and there is now a kingdom of Italy, that is going to mimic that Piedmont constitutional monarchy. So Italy, the, the you know, kingdom of Italy will be a constitutional monarchy once it unifies. In Germany, we will see that they will create, when they unify as Germany, okay, they will create a classically conservative authoritarian empire. And this is because the nucleus around which Germany unifies was the Kingdom of Prussia, which was an authoritarian absolute monarchy. And so Germany as a nation will mimic the nucleus that was an authoritarian absolute monarchy. So the empire of Germany will be an authoritarian absolute monarchy once it unifies. Now let's talk about Italy first. The unification movement in Italy, okay, begins with that kingdom of Piedmont, that Italian, small Italian city kingdom of Piedmont, which was a constitutional monarchy. And it really all begins with the prime minister of Piedmont, okay? Remember, it's a constitutional monarchy. So yes, there is a king, but there is also a parliament. So the parliament in Piedmont was had a prime minister, okay? Much like the British parliament had a prime minister. And that man was Camillo Cavour. Camillo Cavour, prime minister of Piedmont, ultimately used both Italian nationalism which he was an advocate of, okay, um, as well as realpolitik or the politics of reality, pragmatism, deal making and deal breaking, sometimes using warfare if need be, in order to achieve Italian unification. So one of the things that he did first was knowing that the first move to Italian unification was going to be that they had to kick Austria out of those northern Italian provinces of Lombardy and Milan and Venetia, those areas that had rebelled in 1848 against Austrian control and lost, okay? He knows that he's going to need help in doing so, okay? And the best thing to do was to make an alliance with the natural enemy of Austria since the French Revolution, and that, of course, is France, okay? Now, at this point of time in France, France is under the um, government of Emperor Napoleon III. Remember, the guy who had originally been the nephew of Napoleon, he had started off as the president of the Second French Republic. It was established in the 1848 revolution, but he quickly took over um, completely and became the, crowned himself the emperor of France, once again, another Bonaparte as an emperor, okay? Now, in return, this is how the deal that was made between the Camilla Cavour, the Prime Minister of Piedmont, and um, Emperor Napoleon III of France. France would um, 
support the unification movement in Northern Italy, meaning that if Piedmont goes to war with Austria to unify those Northern Italian provinces with Piedmont and kick out the Austrian forces there, that France would receive some territory in the Mediterranean region for their support, okay? And so some of those territories like Nice, France, which is on, you know, like the French Riviera, those kinds of territories. And so France agrees and quickly the army of Piedmont has support from the army of France and they go to war against the Austrians and free or liberate their neighbors in the northern part of Italy, uh, Venetia, Lombardy, and those areas, Milan, okay? So now basically by um, 1858 or so, all of Northern Italy has been united under the greater Piedmont, okay? So this is the beginning of creating a united Italy, okay? So we've ousted Austria, we've unified the Northern part of Italy. In the South, however, this was going to be different. Now, in the middle part of Italy, there was a little bit of a barrier that would be a problem, and that was the Pope. The Pope was not supportive of the Italian nationalism. He was not supportive of the unification movement because he saw it as a threat to his own political power in Central Italy, his Papal States regions. So, Cavour knew that if he was going to achieve full Italian unification, that he was going to have to get the support of Southern Italy first, and that if they got Southern Italy to unify with Northern Italy now under Piedmont's control, they could kind of force the Pope into a vice, kind of squeeze him into submission, okay? So he approached an Italian nationalist who had been a major... Um, mover and shaker in the Italian nationalism movement earlier in the 19th century, um, a patriot in the kingdom of um, the two Sicilies, also known as Sicily and Naples. His name was Giuseppe Garibaldi, okay? And so uh, Giuseppe Garibaldi uh, was able to oust the king, the king from the kingdom of the two Sicilies. Okay, so now all of the southern part of Italy is united for this Italian nationalist cause. Garibaldi and Cavour agreed that they had similar interests in Italian unification. And so Garibaldi then turned over control of the southern part to the king of Piedmont, okay, that, whose prime minister was Camillo Cavour. So King Victor Emmanuel II of Piedmont will now be seen as the king over not just Piedmont and Northern Italy, but also Southern Italy. So it's only the middle part of Italy that is not unified by 1860. Italy was finally unified completely, forcing the central part, the Papal States into submission as well as the part that uh, in Venice that had been um, uh, reluctant to join in the nationalism effort, okay? After two other small minor wars, the Austro-Prussian War of 1866 and the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, these are actually both wars that are big wars in the German unification movement, but they will have implications smaller implications, but implications in this uh, Italian unification movement ultimately as well. And so finally, but after Central Italy is kind of forced into accepting um, uh, Italian unification, we say that by the end of the 1860s, okay, by 1870 in particular, we have a, a unified Italy. And the Kingdom of Italy will be ruled by Victor Emmanuel um, II of Piedmont. He will become Victor Emmanuel I of Italy. His number will be the first Victor Emmanuel to rule in Italy, okay, but the second that had just ruled over Piedmont. Um, he will become the King of Italy, and he will establish, it will be a constitutional monarchy with an Italian parliament, okay. Camilla Cavour will actually help establish that government 
um, before he retires from politics. Okay, so uh, the Kingdom of Italy will be a constitutional monarchy under the ideas of classical liberalism. Okay, with you know uh, natural rights of man and equality before the law and those kinds of things being enshrined. Okay, mimicking the nucleus around which they unified, which was of course the classically liberal Kingdom of Piedmont. Okay. Now in Germany, Germans looked to Prussia in the cause of German unification. Prussia was an authoritarian state known for its militarism, which we've been discussing for several units now. Okay. Now it's the similar method though, using nationalism as well as realpolitik. Okay, now the realpolitik using war, using deal making and deal breaking and those kinds of things that we saw with the Italian unification movement, that happens also in Germany. Okay, but the realpolitik, the politics of reality, deal making and deal breaking warfare are even more extreme in the German unification movement. It all begins in the 1860s when Prussia, as this authoritarian state, even though it's an authoritarian state, it technically has um, a parliament, a Reichstag. They're more of an advisory body to their monarch, though, than they are really a legislature, a full-fledged legislature. But in the 1860s, the uh, king of, or Kaiser, as they're called, of Prussia was uh, William I or Wilhelm I, as he's sometimes called. And the chief minister or prime minister that worked hand in hand with him was a man named Otto von Bismarck. Bismarck ultimately um, was given even more power by William I to basically run Prussia how Bismarck and Wilhelm I saw fit without having any real challenge come from the Prussian Parliament. This is why we say that the Prussian Parliament, which was known as the Reichstag, really was not a full-fledged legislature, but more of an advisory body, okay? So ultimately what Bismarck will do, he and William I will work together to strengthen the power of Prussia and then to use that power of Prussia to unify all of those other German principalities okay, from the German Confederation into a greater Germany. Instead of classical liberalism being the, the catalyst, however, uh, because that had been the catalyst, um, classical liberalism and nationalism in the failed 1848 revolutions, instead, this time in the 1860s, it's going to be more staunch con classical conservatism coupled with German nationalism it is finally going to actually achieve German unification, okay? So Bismarck will be in charge of strengthening the army, uh, collecting taxes, making tax collection even more um, um, efficient. And he will eventually start to expand Prussia's territory and take other territories, unifying all of those Germanic territories into a greater Germany. He starts by expanding into Denmark. Okay, so there will be a series of wars that Bismarck and Prussia will fight to add territory to Prussia, ultimately unifying all of Central Europe, which we know as Germany, into the Empire of Germany. Okay, as I said, it started with that attacking of Denmark. They attacked Denmark, but before Bismarck attacks De um, Denmark to take uh, German territories from Denmark. He gets the alliance of Austria um, as a means of support. Now, did he really need the support militarily of Austria? No, okay. Prussia had a strong enough army on its own. But if he gets the approval of Austria, and he basically makes a deal with Austria saying, hey, we'll give you a little bit of this land that we're taking. Um, if you support our takeover of this territory, taking these territories, northern German territories, away from Denmark. If he does this, he doesn't have to worry about Austria uh, saying, hey, they're expanding too much and we don't want to see the growth of Germany. That might threaten us. 
he also keeps England and France and others at bay from trying to challenge his expansion tactics. So ultimately, they attack Denmark, Prussia attacks Denmark with the support of Austria. They get those northern German territories away from um, Denmark. They add it to Prussia, Greater Prussia, and that's the beginning of the unification movement, okay? Austria is placated, like I said, by them being given those territories that they wanted from that, from their support of Prussia doing this with Denmark. Now, Bismarck, however, never had any intention, Bismarck and William I, never had any intention of allowing Austria to keep those lands. You see, before he even went to war with Denmark and made that alliance with Austria, his plan was already in place to eventually attack Austria. So that is his method of operation. Whoever is his ally in the previous war will be who he attacks in the next war. And he had this planned out from the very beginning. So in 1866, just two short years after attacking Denmark in 1864, in 1866, Prussia attacked Austria and took that territory that they had just given them back, okay? organizing the Northern German Confederation completely under the control of Prussia. The Catholic provinces in the southern part um, were not now part of a greater Germany, but they had agreed to sign a military alliance with Prussia, okay? But it's gonna take some more convincing in order to get them to um, join with them. Now, before Bismarck and William I, of Prussia attacked Austria, they got support from France to do so. Again, the natural, you know, enemy of Austria, as we saw, you know, in the Italian unification movement, was of course France ever since the French Revolution. So they got um, agreement from Emperor Napoleon III that they would not get involved uh, to in the you know the expansion tactics of Prussia when they fight against Austria as long as the southern German areas remained independent because of course the um, French and the southern German territories they are both Catholic they have lots of trade deals etc and of course Bismarck and William I agree to that at least at the time okay again Bismarck and William I never intended on keeping that alliance for long though, okay? So after solidifying control of all of Northern Germany, after attacking Austria um, and uh, uh, unifying all of Northern German territory under Prussia's control, then four years after that, Bismarck will attack France, okay? so. At this point, he is going to have to do something to keep the international uh, forces at bay, okay? Because this does upset the balance of power. And if he outright attacks France, which is a major mover and shaker in European, you know, um, diplomacy, it's going to look as if he's an aggressor, which he is. When I say he, I mean Bismarck and William I, I mean Prussia, okay? So he has to, uh, Bismarck is brilliant. He has to make it look like France is the aggressor here. And so basically what he does is he maneuvers di diplomatically a way to anger Emperor Napoleon III enough that France actually declares war on Prussia first. So then Prussia just looks like they're defending themselves. And ultimately, by doing this, and he does this with a telegram, the Ems telegram, and you'll learn more about that in your packet and in your textbook. But the point of this is by angering France enough to, you know, uh, diplomatically, um, to get Emperor Napoleon III to declare war on Prussia, he basically makes it easy for Prussia to get the support of those southern German principalities that had signed that military alliance with Prussia before, as long as they would remain independent. Now they see France as the aggressor, and um, those southern uh, principalities now see their best bet um, is to join with 
Prussia or Northern Germany to form a united Germany in order to protect themselves from an aggressive France, what they see now as an aggressive France that might try to expand into Southern Germany. Okay, so anyways, realpolitik, deal-making, deal-breaking, use of war par warfare, raw power, and deceit. Um, Prussia will go to war against France. This will be the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 that I mentioned before, and Prussia will be victorious. When Prussia defeats France, Prussia will be given the territories of Alsace and Lorraine. These were territories that France had acquired, um, you know, in previous wars, uh, in previous centuries. They believed that they were part of their natural territories that they should have control over, and now um, they become part of a greater Germany. Okay, Germany will be declared in 1871 after the Franco-Prussian War is over, um, and France is angry about losing control over Alsace and Lorraine. Not only that, they are very angry because they realized how they were maneuvered into this war. This war ultimately ends with Emperor Napoleon III losing his power. He's captured in battle. Um, the people of France are kind of starved into submission. Um, the Prussians lay siege to the city of Paris. The people of Paris are barricaded in. No food can come in. No supplies can come in. They ultimately break into their own zoo and slaughter animals to feed themselves. It becomes a bad situation. Emperor Napoleon III, still refusing to back down, eventually is captured on the battlefield by the Prussians, now known as the Germans. And ultimately, he has to abdicate his throne. At the end of this war, uh, the Second French Empire comes to an end. Um, we have a strong authoritarian Germany, Empire of Germany, that controls all of Central Europe. Okay, big chunk of it anyways, I should say. And um, we also have a lot of animosity between France and Germany. France will be left with a, a different government. They will establish, once again, they'll try another republic. It'll be the third French Republic. But they have a lot of animosity and resentment towards Germany as a result. This resentment will come, you know, to fruition in World War I as they will be on opposite sides of World War I. The southern German states will agree to enter that union with Prussia, like I said, at the, what they call the Second German Empire, with William I as Kaiser or Emperor will be established. Now, you're probably wondering why it's called the Second German Empire or the Second Reich, Reich meaning empire. They see the First Holy Roman Empire uh, as, a, uh, as the First German Empire, okay, meaning after... Um, the Middle Ages, when there was a Holy Roman Empire, at the beginning of this course, when we saw, you know, we saw Charles V or Charles V in place, etc. So the Second German Reich, or Empire, will be declared with who had been the King of Prussia, William I, now being the Kaiser or Emperor of all of Germany. And of course, he will keep as his right-hand man, okay, his Iron Chancellor, as he will be called, Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. Now, what about other parts of Europe? Okay, well, other parts of Europe, we see nationalism having a major impact as well. Okay, while Italy and Germany were being unified with nationalism, other states in Europe were also um, changing uh, due to reform, or in some cases, restriction of reform. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what's going on in England. <clears throat> in England, or Great Britain as it's now called, Great Britain was actually able to avoid the revolutions going on throughout Europe in the middle of the 19th century. As revolutions are happening all throughout Europe, the revolutions of 1830, the revolutions of 1848 in particular, that revolutionary virus, we see we don't have a lot of that kind of upheaval going on in Great Britain, largely because the British government was already a constitutional monarchy, the British Parliament already had a lot of power, and through that British Parliament, 
there were already a lot of reforms, both social reforms and political reforms being made on a, a you know, little bit by little bit basis. Okay, this is sometimes referred to as evolutionary liberalism in England, meaning that both the, the classical liberal party in England, which will be the Whigs, and the classical conservative party of the Tories, both of them in Parliament, um, will work to advocate some kind of reform. They just had different approaches to how fast and widespread they wanted reforms to be. But both sides believed in reforms. And because these reforms were being done, there was no need for revolution. So Parliament, through the last half of the 19th century, expanded voting privileges little bit by little bit. That's why we call it evolutionary. Okay. Ultimately, so all of the middle class will have voting rights. And the middle class was now had an interest in ruling. Okay. By the end of the 19th century, they will have universal male suffrage as well, but that won't happen until the end. The Industrial Revolution that had started in England, okay, that had been more widespread in England than anywhere else because it started there first, allowed the wages of workers to rise significantly as well. So the working class was now able to share in the prosperity. And so, especially after unions were legalized in Great Britain, this sort of kept socialism from growing too largely in England. Okay, so instead of socialism becoming a, a challenge to the traditional uh, or to the constitutional monarchy in England, um, instead, socialist tendencies were incorporated into the unionist movements, and they were advocating for reforms um, for the workers and ultimately bargaining co collectively with the bosses to get some better wages and better conditions for the workers. Because of the growth of unionism in England, um, you know, socialism was not as much of a challenge to uh, the government in England as it might be in other places because those, those uh, pushes for um, social and economic reforms were being made through, you know, unionism and through incorporating more and more people into the, um, the voting in England. By the end of the 19th century, workers are even allowed to vote, universal male suffrage. Um, and it's since they think they have a say in the government, at least through the electoral process, um, they feel as if demands are being met. Although slowly, that's what we call it evolutionary liberalism, it does allow for changes to be made. Queen Victoria, who ruled Great Britain throughout most of this time period, she ruled from 1837 to 1901, actually reflected this nationalistic pride of British citizens. But they had a pride in all that they had accomplished through the Industrial Revolution. They had a pride in the fact that they, uh, you know, she actually advocated for reforms to be made um, to, to the benefit of all citizens of Great Britain. And the people adored her as a result of that. And ultimately, her she worked well with Parliament throughout these years rather than against Parliament. And so, as such, she was known as a great queen um, who kind of advocated middle class values, if you will. And, um, you know, this evolutionary um, reform process would be fostered by her support. Now, in France, uh, at going back to when Louis Napoleon had been, you know, elected as the president of the Second French Republic during the Revolution of 1848. So he's the one who becomes Emperor Napoleon III. And this is, you know, kind of back on time here. How did that all come about? Um, Louis Napoleon asked the French people for the restoration of the empire. Um, after the revolution of 1848 had happened, he had been elected president. And then because of his popularity, because of his name, um, he was able to use the plebiscite or that national referendum vote like his great uncle had done, and 97% of the people wanted an emperor. They at least wanted an emperor that was a Bonaparte. They thought that another Bonaparte as an emperor might mean that France will 
rule all of Europe once again, if you will. So he becomes Napoleon III, even though there was never a Napoleon II, okay? He becomes Emperor Napoleon III, ruling an authoritarian government that limited civil liberties, actually. Uh, so they went from having that brief uh, second French Republic to him becoming an emperor and then reversing a lot of the um, good things that had happened. Even though Napoleon III was an emperor, uh, got rid of the Second Republic, um, and it was an authoritarian government again, he did do a lot of good things for France, however. Okay, he did expand the economy with government subsidies for infrastructure improvement. Um, especially when it came to creating wide boulevards. Um, he recognized that the streets throughout Paris in particular, the capital city, were very narrow, um, and that if they were ever going to have trade move more freely um, through the streets, they need to create larger, expansive boulevards. Also, he recognized that by doing so, creating large boulevards like the Champs-Élysées in the middle of Paris, it's more difficult for barricades to be put up when revolutions happened, okay? So he was trying to minimize the amount of revolts and revolutions um, because those barricades that would go up in the streets would actually bring business to a halt. So if you have these wide, expansive boulevards instead of these narrow streets, it's going to be a whole lot harder for those rioters to barricade the streets um, and stop business. So it's pretty smart if you think about it. He ultimately rebuilt Paris with these wide boulevards, with public squares, underground sewers, and street lights. The uh, Paris became known as the City of Lights as a result. And ultimately, the Paris that you see today has a lot to do with Napoleon III. Napoleon III also gave the legislature, even though he was an emperor, there was still a legislature. And eventually, he will give the legislature more power when opposition to some of his economic policies arose. And ultimately, that is what keeps him in power. If it hadn't been for losing the Franco-Prussian War to the uh, Prussians, to William I and Bismarck, uh, then perhaps, you know, he would have been in power a whole lot longer and history would have been completely different. Now, what about in Austria? As we know, Austria being a polyglot empire, nationalism was a problem for the Austrian Empire because it contained so many different ethnic groups. Back after the uh, failed revolutions of 1848 um, failed to create some of these national governments that had revolted against Austrian control, like the Hungarians, uh, it, uh, by the 1860s, there started to be some grumblings again, especially in the area of Hungary. Hungary was a fairly large territory um, that was controlled by Austria. And after the initial revolution of 1848 was put down in Hungary, by 1867, there were pushes coming once again from the traditional Hungarian nationalists for their own nation. Ultimately, Austria, the Austrian emperor, agreed to the creation of a dual monarchy of what will be known as the Austrian -Hung Hungarian Empire or Austria Hungary. Uh, this was kind of a compromise, if you will. That's why it's called the Compromise of 1867. Instead of giving them complete freedom, um, each part of this now dual monarchy or dual empire had its own, some of its own governing forces, but it was united in other areas. So for example, each part, Austria and Hungary, each had their own constitution. They each had their own legislature and its own capital city. Vienna will continue to be Austria's capital. Budapest will be Hungary's capital. But they shared other things. They were held together by a shared monarch, one monarch, okay, one army, and one financial system. So they will be united militarily and financially, and ultimately the head head monarch, but they will each have their own local governing structures and their own um, um, capitals and their own legislatures. This compromise allowed um, what would now be known as the Austro-Hungarian Empire to remain intact 
rather than unravel um, in the mid 1800s, the 1860s. What about in Russia? Well, Russia is a little bit different, okay? After being defeated in the Crimean War, which was a huge blow to the Russian ego, okay? Russia realized that it had to really modernize. Now, modernization had begun under Peter the Great, Tsar Peter the Great, long before, you know, a century and a half before this, but it had been halted um, after his reign. It had been, uh, Catherine the Great had tried to renew um, modernization once again during her reign, but again had been halted by the end of her reign. The Russian czars had traditionally been suspicious of westernization, seeing it as trying to change Russia too much, and they wanted to make sure Russia maintained its Russian-ness, if you will. Um, and ultimately, this will be an issue. Because Russia had not fully modernized by the middle of the 1800s, in 1853, when the czar at the time, Tsar Nicholas I, um, tried to attack the Ottoman Empire. Well, not that the Ottoman Empire was modernized, but when, you know, he thought that they would be able to defeat the Ottoman Empire to take the Crimean Peninsula. But when the Ottoman Empire got the support of Great Britain and France, both whom had, who had um, industrialized and they both had massive military forces that were now mechanized because of industrialization, they could not, uh, Russia could not defeat them. Russia was a large rural agricultural society that depended on the authority of the central government to function as an Eastern power. So it was still a very authoritarian, um, absolute monarchy. And the monarchy in Russia was very dependent upon the Russian nobles to keep the peasants in line. And so really, Feudalism was still very prevalent in Russian society, at least in the case of how the peasants were treated, okay? Um, Tsar Alexander II will inherit the throne uh, the last year of the Crimean War that his father had started, okay? And it's because of Tsar Alexander II that in 1856, um, he pulls Russia out of the war. He admits defeat. Uh, he agrees to the treaty terms with um, Turkey and um, France and England, and he basically cuts his losses. He is the one who tries to push reforms once again, or westernization once again in Russia. He decided that, you know, he said, the, the reason why we lost the Crimean War is because we were not industrialized, because we were not modernized like the rest of Europe. The only way we will be able to compete with the rest of Europe is to be more like the rest of Europe, to be more modernized. So he decided to enact reforms, okay, um, from the top, from the top down, kind of like Peter the Great had done, kind of like Catherine the Great had done. And in 1861, he issued an emancipation edict freeing all of the Russian serfs. Now, this is important, okay? Because now those Russian nobles that the czars had always been kind of dependent upon for their support were a little angry about this. They were angry that they had lost all of that basically, you know, complete control that they had had over the Russian peasantry for so many hundreds of years. The new system did not, however, improve the lives of the serfs as Alexander II had hoped. Okay, Alexander's other reforms ultimately will lead to more and more animosity against him. The nobles were not happy that he had emancipated the serfs. The serfs or former serfs were not happy that he had not enacted enough reforms to alleviate their um, problems, uh, financial problems. They wanted him to redistribute the land so that they all had access to land, and he didn't do that. So. He basically didn't please anybody. He ticked everybody off, okay? And this will lead to eventually, 20 years after he had emancipated the serfs, in 1881, he will be assassinated. It is not by the nobles or by the serfs that he's assassinated. Instead, it is by a radical group of um, anarchists that are in opposition to any and all authority. They, uh, because they assassinated him in 1881, his plans for creating 
um, a constitutional government for Russia. He was in agreement to allow himself to be limited by a parliament and create finally a constitutional monarchy in Russia. But that will be completely undone with his assassination. And as a reaction, a knee-jerk knee -jerk reaction against what, you know, uh, had occurred to him, his son, who will be Alexander III, instead of continuing with the reforms of his father, saw that those reforms got his father killed and ultimately returned to the old methods of repression in Russia. He will go back to being a, a you know, iron-fisted, authoritarian czar and rush all of that modernization that had been restarted again by his father, Alexander II, will be halted once again. This means that at the dawn of the 20th century, okay, as World War I is approaching, Russia is still in, you know, uh, backwards. They're still not fully industrialized when the rest of Europe had industrialized. This is going to be a problem for Russia going forward as we enter World War I. So another thing to keep in mind as we move forward. Now, what about in the United States? Yeah, I know that this is mostly a European history course, but we do talk about um, the United States as they relate to Europe. And a lot of the same things that are going on in Europe impact what's going on in the United States. Something that I mentioned in an earlier unit was that uh, in the United States, the, the Napoleonic Wars ended up causing issues. So we had a, the War of 1812 going on in the United States um, as a byproduct of those Napoleonic Wars. Um, eventually, we come out on top of that situation against Great Britain once again. But then we are later embroiled in a bloody civil war that will last from 1861 to 1865. So in the United States, the Federalists and the Republicans struggled over political control of the country. The Federalists wanted a stronger, larger central government. The Republicans wanted more independence for the states. Okay. Um, and ultimately, the victory in the War of 1812 over Great Britain ended a lot of those divisions for a little while and gave Americans a surge in nationalistic pride because we all agreed that we didn't want Great Britain to be a thorn in our side once again. Okay? It gave us something in common to uh, rally behind. But in the middle of the 19th century, slavery became the biggest threat to the American political and social systems. And this is what threatened to tear the nation um, apart. Ultimately, abolitionism in the North challenged the Southern way of life. And with the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860, South Carolina voted to secede from the Union. Shortly after, six more Southern states joined them and formed the Confederate States of America. This is a an exercise in nationalism. They saw themselves as a separate nation to the rest of the United States. So it is an exercise in nationalism. This civil war ultimately is a nationalistic war. The nationalism of the southern states versus the nationalism of the Union itself. The American Civil War will last four years. Ultimately, the Union, which wanted to keep all of the states together, defeated the Confederacy in the South in 1865. And by doing so, not only did the, they preserve the Union itself, the unity of the United States, but they also ended slavery and created one nation once again. 